I'm glad to join. Wish I could be there. I wanted to thank so much for Anne Sophie for inviting me over and would have loved to have been there. So we did change the talks around this morning. Uh, we decided to put mine first because I'm doing kind of an overview talk. There's really not an emphasis on uh, the inversion models themselves. Rather, this is a talk that I give particularly to medical students on what does it mean when we do dipole modeling or just source modeling? What is source reconstruction from electrophysiologic data? And what are the models that we use? So have this catchy subtitle, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And we're gonna emphasize the, the physiologic basis of the current dipole. How do we interpret the results that we see? And you'll see shortly from the other two speakers talks about uh, MEG source modeling and EEG source modeling. But for now, we're gonna look at more of the basis of what forms these models and try to make it very interpretable is the key. So I think we're all mostly familiar with this model, particularly in this crowd. Uh, this is from the uh, taken out of the 93 Reviews of Modern Physics paper that I think many of us use as a reference by Hamelain and et al. And it's a drawing by Ramoni Cajal showing the uh, pyramidal cells. So the key feature on the pyramidal cells is their length and that the primary working model, and it's, it's arguable, but the primary working model is that we're looking at postsynaptic potential summed over millions of neurons in tens of milliseconds. So we're not looking at action potentials. We're not doing single unit recordings. We're not looking into individual spike firing. We're looking at a macrocellular model, clearly not a microcellular. And recently had the chance with Mati uh, Hamelainen and Demetrius Pantazis. Uh, I say recent, but that's pre-COVID, so that's not so recent. But MIT and Cambridge had uh, Ramoni Cajal's drawings from the 1890s. It was great to see the originals and see such beautiful drawings from over 100 years ago. So this is our kind of working figure. We have this forest of neurons in the gray matter, but the emphasis is on these very long pyramidal cells. And the afferents are coming into these cells either high in the dendritic arbor or low in the dendritic arbor. And what, what can we tell about that? So we have excitatory postsynaptic potential coming in high in the tree. It's an active negativity that at the macrocellular model, there are, there are microcellular currents that people draw out even in this drawing, but at the macrocellular level, we create a primary current dipole going down the tree. This is excitation high, creates essentially a passive positivity low, and we get a current dipole down. Equally ambiguous is if we have inhibitory activity down near the soma. This is like an active positivity down here, and it pulls the current down the tree. Either way, these are primary current generators from a macro scale that are pumping the currents that we see in the model. And then the uh, afferents come in at two different levels, the sort of working model, and again, everything in this can be argued one point or another, but these are kind of the lesser arguments or, or lesser argued uh, that thalamal cortical afferents generally come in low into the dendritic arbors. So they come around layer four, five, six, hitting low down near the soma, creating an active negativity and driving the current up this column. And then more, uh, the theory more generally is that contralateral cortex and just cortical cortical afferents are sailing along in the upper layers creating active negativities high. So this is excitation low, excitation high. Either way, we start to envision at this model that we're driving currents up and down the pyramidal uh, cells, up and down the cortex. And so that leads to sort of our, our wrong model, the idea of a cortical column. But it's a very nice, useful model in that we now emphasize the 2D cortical surface up here at top of layer one and typically in units of square millimeters, but it encompasses the entire sort of complexity of the cortical column, all the layers of it, but we're kind of ignoring the complexity of within the column, exactly where the currents are occurring, how strong they are, what their length are. We just sort of assign a elemental current dipole to this column and ignore the transversal components that are occurring as well. But it's useful in that it lets us convert from the true 3D nature of neural activity to more of a 2D representation along the cortex. It's important though to note, so this was uh, Paul Nunes and uh, 
uh, Ramesh Srinivasan put this out. I, I'm missing the date here. I think about 2018, you know, relatively recently, reminding us all that the cortex is not columnar everywhere. In many regions, we have this nice representation that I just started to draw. But in many other regions, uh, in normal cortex, say like I think motor cortex is a good example, we don't have this nice columnar organization, but also I do a lot of work in epilepsy now, uh, dysplastic regions. So uh, they're reminding us that there are regions where we don't have this columnar organization, others that we do, but good enough for now, we're going to assume that we're gonna use the cortical ribbon as our, our model and talk in terms of the units of square millimeters on this cortical surface. So how do we model this cortical surface? And in the years I've been in this, this field very nicely matured. There's wonderful packages out there right now that lets us go in on, you know, this is a formalin fixed actual segment of uh, cortex. We see postcentral gyrus, precentral gyrus, and we literally see the gray matter and the central sulcus. And we just model that ribbon. And all along that ribbon, we put these little elemental uh, dipoles, these representing these cortical columns, and think of the 2D surface of this rather than the 3D thickness of the mantle. And just very briefly, just as a reminder, then when we have each of these little elemental cortical dipoles that we can build the entire model on by right-hand rule the, of, where, of the direction of the currents flowing, the magnetic fields are circulating around this dipole. We have coming off the front of the dipole, the positivity, so we have positive potentials on the surface, negative potentials corresponding on the other direction of surface, volume currents flowing around that complete the circuit, and all of those currents then creating a magnetic field, again, by right-hand rule coming in and out. The key, and this is what I, I don't know, I just somebody can find a reference sometime, but a lot of particularly uh, medical students are taught somewhere in their training that EEG and MEG do have different sources, but the emphasis, at least from our modeling perspective, is that they both have exactly the same primary generator, this primary drive that begins at the elemental cortical, cortical level, uh, and there's not a difference on it. And I'm never sure exactly, but we try to emphasize this in our teachings that there's not a difference in what drives EEG, scalp EEG, and, and MEG. So we have these excellent packages now. Uh, this is a little bit older chart that I made several years ago where it was uh, in my world. I mean, we all have our little echo chambers, but BrainSuite and FreeSurfer were the primary package we used. And so this is a surgical photo that a colleague of mine took, you know, of one of our patients at Cleveland Clinic. And then I rendered it both through BrainSuite and FreeSurfer and compared the results and realized, you know, this is just great. There's some subtle differences the way the two packages work. But overall, we see right here the classic knuckle. If you bend your finger and look at the your knuckle, you'll see the knuckle here. And once you find the knuckle, then you find the central sulcus, you find the motor strip. And if we go over here into our renderings, we see the nice knuckle and central sulcus and motor strip. And then we start to see our overall brain. So uh, I'm always very happy these days with uh, the way the packages render these surfaces. And they've gotten faster and faster now. So the advantage of these surfaces particularly is they generate typically hundreds of thousands of little vertices connected by faces. So faces and vertices are now the standard for uh, surface modeling that wasn't always that way, but particularly thanks to the first person shooter games, faces and uh, vertices became the de facto standard. Very convenient again for us in this kind of modeling that each vertex is now easily identified and found and then linked lists tell you which faces go with which vertices and then which vertices are connected which other vertices faces etc so the free surfer and brain suite will typically render something on the order of 500,000 600,000 of these vertices whereas uh, for modeling purposes we typically reduce it down to tens of thousands of triangles and even in this picture it uh, represents kind of the lower limit I like to work with, and, and it's our default in Brainstorm, for instance, about 15,000 total vertices, 7,500 per hemisphere with twice as many faces connecting them. Still gives you a very realistic rendition of the cortical surface, but it also immediately sets up then, back to our model, 
of each one of these vertices now is one of these cortical columns with support by the faces immediately adjacent it. But we still think of this as our elemental current dipole, our, our little uh, cortical column rising up from the depths of the cortex. And yet it has a very realistic shape now. Oh, wrong. There we go. So it also, again, thanks to the uh, gamers, the graphics cards now are lightning fast, uh, you know, 60 frames per second easily. And you get out entire link lists if you just hand, hand this to any graphics card. So every vertex is connected to every other vertex, every face up to every other face. And you can relatively instantaneously form patches. So patches are our intuition of the region of interest. And we already know from all of the segmentation algorithms that we use that there's uh, a variety of, of segmentation labels that we like to use, particularly in, if you run FreeSurfer a lot, you get Desk and Killaney and Destru uh, segmentations. But now there's dozens of these atlases coming out that all very nicely break this cortical surface into regions. And it's very easy to pull out these regions as very intuitive, very physiologic, patches and it is our true idea of a distributed source. So we rarely ever think that there's just a single vertex driving our, our data. We know it's a region of interest, a patch, and in particularly in epilepsy, we believe these patches are, are uh, abnormal. So we're looking for a dysplastic region uh, that will be possibly resected, but it's very physiologic and intuitive to think of a distributed source. So what can we do with this distributed source model? And this is a paper put together with uh, Kareem and Sylvan uh, when I was working with uh, Richard Leahy many years ago now. We went in and said, let's model the actual patch. And we're going to use, instead of a current dipole, we used a current multipole to model this. And so we went in on a, on not the peel surface of the time, but the gray, uh, the gray white interface, but we formed uh, patches on there from 50 square millimeters to 500 square millimeters following these cortical folds. And so now we have dozens, if not hundreds of vertices on a patch. And we assigned in this case, I think we just used uniform, but it's very intuitive to think that there is some sort of activity on this patch. And now by electromagnetic superposition, this is what we actually record in the data is the total activity coming from all of these uh, dozens, if not hundreds of vertices on a patch. The question is, how can we simply model that? And so we said, well, the classic is the equivalent current dipole, not the elemental, but the equivalent current dipole. And then just using first order multipolar expansions, we call the next one multipoles, a first order multipole. Now, I've been trying to explain multipoles to non-physicists and non-engineers for years, and nobody, nobody gets it. It's much easier to sell a concept of a patch but we do know mathematically that we can represent this not just as a current dipole, but a little bit more sophisticated model of a dipole plus a quadrupole. And so indeed we then fit these patches with both models, the, the beautiful first order multipole and then the current dipole. Now the scale over here is 100% goodness of fit because this was high fidelity data. We kept the noise quite low, but this means that the current dipoles we got to 500 square millimeters only got down to 99% goodness of fit. This wasn't very exciting. The idea is that the equivalent current dipole still really was quite representing quite well what the, uh, these real patches look like. And the localization error represented by these bars was only shifting a little bit. We were looking at the centroid relative to the multipole versus the centroid to the dipole. And what we found was there's about an improvement of one and a half millimeters in localization error. That's just not exciting for all the complexity and trying to explain what this model is. So particularly for clinical use, we're always arguing or not arguing, we're just explaining to them, telling the, the, uh, the medical students and, and staff that equivalent current dipoles do represent patches quite well and that you're fine doing equivalent current dipole modeling because this is the bread and butter of, of epilepsy work. We fit equivalent current dipoles all day long and really don't get more involved with the others, primarily because time is short and you've got to get an answer out immediately. So the higher order moments of these patches are not easily estimated without uh, concurrently better head modeling and noise estimation that a 
we would argue, don't often see in practice. So the equivalent current dipole is the sort of a, a kingpin of this of these patches and can be modeled. The source model I'm going to discuss here now is extremely basic. I'm not getting into any kind of uh, highly comparative discussion, just sticking to the basics, but trying to get across the idea that you go away with is the intuition and what you should demand of any package. I think this crowd all knows that, you know, MEG is whole head coverage, either through axial gradiometers or planar gradiometers. The key being we get as good a whole head coverage as we can uh, to the extent that we have to put our head in a helmet. And then we have the controls these days, thanks to the uh, all the MRI modeling and source modeling, or not source modeling, but a registration modeling. We have a really good idea, in this case, the planar gradiometers where each of the sensors are relative to the subject and relative to the cortex. And at Cleveland Clinic and at UT Health, uh, and as a policy of the American Clinical MEG Society, we always strongly recommend that when collecting uh, MEG, you also always collect EEG, uh, at least the 1020 pattern. So we're always simultaneously collecting the 1020 pattern of sensors, if not denser, although again, uh, for time purposes, 1020 is still kind of the king. And so we develop in very nicely complementary uh, information. So the in this case, the current dipole is here. We have positive, negative by right-hand rule. And we can see this in the data, positive off the front of the dipole, negative off the end, perpendicular to the patterns we see in the MEG array, positive coming out of the helmet, negative going back into the helmet. So it's definitely not redundant information to do this, but rather highly complementary information. Now, uh, head modeling is an entire topic in itself. So this is the only chart. I'll show some results later of some recent work we're doing in finite element modeling. But in the head modeling, uh, what we do is take this elemental current uh, dipole the prime, and treat it as a primary current. And then we can mathematically drive it in this overall, otherwise realistic models as realistic as we make it. Uh, the volume currents, volume conduction, however you want to term this, is the passive currents that flow because of the potentials that were set up uh, and the uh, potentials and the current being driven by our primary source. So we think of the primary disc equivalent current dipole as a little battery driving the currents and then the boundaries shape these currents in ways that we have to take care of. And it's all very technically difficult, but at the end of the day, for every location that we put a primary current dipole, we can complete the model, get all the secondary currents, and then calculate the unique EEG or MEG sensor solution dipole by dipole. When we do this and connect all the dipoles together in our grid, then we can call this the lead field model. That is the lead fields that would be generated by scalp electrodes or would be generated by uh, the magnetic sensors. But let's just accept that we have our lead field. We've created, we've created a model. Uh, particularly in the uh, vendor software that we use clinically, you're always given a, a big fat button that says fit the dipole. And in this case, this is the uh, Neuromag interface. And this is Mati Hamalainen's underlying code from uh, many years ago. And it's rock solid code that if you do it right, you get a good dipole fit. That is a, again, a topic we teach separately on what are good stats. And today, uh, for now, for this talk, you'll see more later, Let's accept that we have good chi-square error relative, so we've got good noise covariance and whiten the data, and that our confidence intervals are good. That is to say, the volume of error is good, and our goodness of fit is also good. The real thing is, what happens when you particularly an MEG fit a current dipole, and you're given this units of 176 nanoamp meter? Uh, what does 176 nanoamp meter source represent? Can you really believe that? Is this something that is useful in your modeling? So. Accepting for now, this is just emphasizing the equivalent current dipole model that the fit was good. We're not arguing, you know, maybe you did it right, maybe you did it wrong. We're just saying it was a good fit. How do we interpret what this dipole model is and does it make sense? So this is the interpretation of the dipole model. Because again, when MEG comes to patient management and they're presented with all these little current dipoles, a lot of them just sort of look at you like they're not really still grasping what you mean by the current dipole. So how we can interpret this, so we 
we typically, when we do evoke studies, as many of you probably have done in, in your evoked work, and you do a, you know, average up the data, you'll see something on order of 20 nanometers. That could be 10, it could be 20, it could be 30. But if you fit an equivalent current dipole, it's in the ballpark of 20 nanometer. This is what's typically seen for evoked studies. This can sort of, sort of natural response activity. Whereas in epilepsy, we're usually looking for abnormal activity that's 10 times stronger, something on the order of 200 nanometers. So how do we infer when we've done this dipole fit, we're told the statistics say these are good numbers. We're, we trust these numbers, but what do we infer about this? And so we're back to this model that we came back with back to the beginning of this current dipole, in this case, traveling down the, the our cortical column. And so th this goes, this is very arguable, uh, but there's good work in this. This is actually was presented in, in uh, Hamelina's 93 review paper. So the, the Finns very nicely summarized the work even as of 1993, that the working model is that each pyramidal cell can generate about 10 peak lamps up and down the column, flowing along an electrical length of about two millimeters which is to say it's 20 picoamp millimeters are capable in one pyramidal cell or doing MKS conversion, 20 femtoamp meters. But then it was already known at this point that we're seeing more on the order of 20 nanoamp meters. So the immediate assumption generally held is that we're looking at 1 million cells when we're looking at an equivalent current dipole. And we don't know where these 1 million cells, how dense they are yet. We'll come to that in a moment, but the working model is about 1 million. Now, as easy arguments to say, well, no, it's not a million, it's 100,000. Okay, it could also be even be 10 million. But this is the ballpark we're in. We're not 1, 10, 100,000, 10,000. We're in the category of 100,000 million or more, creating one of these equivalent current dipoles that we're modeling. And the epilepsy spikes are running more like 100 microamps down these cortical columns of about 2 millimeters length. So these are 200 nanoamp meter spikes. Now, also, when we do uh, a lot of invasive studies, we're putting grids inside the brain. We uh, also do uh, electrical stimulation of these electrodes. And so, again, to put the units back into perspective, a classic sort of stimulation of deep brain stimulation or SEEG or even ECOG is to put 4 milliamps of current bipolar configuration into about 5 millimeter contact separation. So this sets up, again, a current dipole. It's 4 milliamps four milliamps into five millimeters, so 20 milliamp millimeters or 20,000 nanomat meter stimulation. So a lot of electrical stimulation really is pulling out a sledgehammer and banging on the brain in regions that even abnormally are generating currents uh, at least 100, if not a thousand times smaller. But again, the units are very real, very physical. And if we look at a stain or uh, uh, various stains of actual, in this case, the central sulcus, we can see this kind of scale that even with invasive electrodes that are two millimeters long, we're still looking at large regions of cortex gathered into the, uh, in, even into an invas invasive electrode, let alone surface cortex. So the driving thing is that this is clearly a macrocellular model uh, and we're not looking at a single point or an even a tiny point of the brain how big of an area are we looking? Can we do some sort of inference about the, the region? So we can ask the modeling question, then back to our cortical columns, how much current can one square millimeter generate then? So we're back to this idea of our, our model and we're back to you know, ignore all the complexity, just go back to the, cort the cortical surface and say, what can we do for one square millimeter? And indeed, Yoshio Okada has done a lot of study in this. This is a summary paper he put out in in 2015, uh, where he also did very uh, separate papers from this one with Murakami. They did very nice finite element models of exactly at pyramidal cells. And they're one of the ones that will indeed argue they were off by an order of magnitude. It's not 20 femtoamp meter, but more like 200 femtoamp meter in a single pyramidal cell. So it's not a million, it's a hundred thousand. Uh, some very good arguments in there. And even HFOs might be coming out through these. So there's, I say, there's been a lot of work since then on the details of it, but he also invasively studied a lot of mammalian structures uh, and came up with what looks like kind of an upper limit on what the mammalian cortex can generate. And so with this idea of the cortical column, he came up with this kind of unusual unit of a nanoamp meter 
per square millimeter. There's a tendency to want to divide the meters in there and just do this as nano amps per millimeter, but that, that unit's not as interpretable. This unit is exactly in line with our idea of the cortical column. We've got a square millimeter of cortex and what his invasive studies and experiments and research has shown that one nano amp meter is reaching a upper limit as to what a cortical column can generate. So this is the rat cortex went up as high as two, the swine cortex just shy of one, monkey about half, two SEEG patients were running about half, turtle cerebellum about one, guinea pig hippocampus uh, less than one. So this is not 1.0, you know, this is a scale here. We're not arguing that uh, it's a 1.0, it's a very precise, but again, it puts us in the ballpark, it puts us in the region that it's very difficult to find evidence that a, a square millimeter of cortex is ever capable of generating much more than a nanoamp meter of dipolar current in that region. And so this then becomes a very working model for us, convenient for immediate scaling of cortical areas. And we can go back to our equivalent current dipole model and say that when we pull out this unit of 20 nanometer, that we're looking at a minimum of 20 square millimeters of cortex. Uh, it could be easily much larger and that uh, epilepsy is probably a minimum with some an asterisk next to it, a minimum of 200 square millimeters. However, that number is actually quite consistent with many, many other studies of epilepsy patients that suggest intraictal spike data is something on the order of 300 to 500 square millimeters of cortex in order to be visible. So again, our, our units, our numbers are all working out as to just what region of cortex uh, is represented by this equivalent current dipole. It should also, though, be very transparent, I would hope to you at this point in this early, well, early morning for me, late afternoon for you after you've already had lunch, probably. But, you know, that, that Okada constant, you can play with that number. What if I just change one nanometer to 0 0.1? There is a continuum there. Then these numbers go up by an order of magnitude. These are 200 square millimeter. And we're looking at almost 2,000 square millimeter, if we could believe that. But by a single inferential parameter, this is not estimated, this is inferred from outside information, we can slide between these two numbers and easily change the size of the distributed source that we modeled uh, by up to a factor of 10 with, without even a, a second thought. But flip side is, it doesn't get much smaller than this. We're not down to a vertex. So when we get an equivalent current dipole out and we locate it, somewhere in this region, it's representing the, a nearby patch of cortex. It's not a perfect point of, of current. We just don't believe that that's possibly possible to generate. So summarizing up then the equivalent current dipole interpretation summary, uh, extended sources nonetheless compressed to models of point equivalent current dipoles. Uh, every now and then somebody who's particularly in patient management that's a bit more boned up on the models and say, how come we're using these simple models? Why aren't we using more extended models? And we come back with, yeah, once you do this estimation, you've got to realize these current dipoles we're bringing to you actually do represent extended regions. The key advantage for simplicity purposes is that a single current dipole has three degrees, three locations, locate, or three parameters location and three of orientation and strength that we can estimate those quite rigorously with good stats uh, Kramer, uh, uh, chi-square errors and confidence intervals on there. So we believe we're estimating in real practical conditions with noisy clinical data. We're estimating quite reliably the parameters of a single current dipole and that we can then from that infer almost immediately the true extent of these sources through a very simple scalar parameter of this Okada constant. As I just mentioned, minor variations of that can radically change that patch but then I also would uh, throw back to you that if you're studying a source estimation model that says to you, it can estimate for you the extent of the source, you should question or ask, well, what is your underlying assumed current density? How are you handling this parameter? What happens if you play with this one single parameter? How does it change your estimate, your inference of what source extent is? So, uh, Let's look at, you know, this has been kind of MEG uh, intensive at the moment. Uh, also, but it equally applies to EEG, but now let's more specifically look at 
just EEG and how we handle some of the problems with EEG and then bypass them by going invasive. So it's always tricky to talk about EEG versus MEG. This was particularly in the uh, early 90s when MEG was first coming around. This is getting quite contentious. Uh, and then what we saw was fMRI come onto the scene and sort of blow the whole argument out of the water. It became EEG and MEG versus fMRI. And today, I think we're all a much happier family. Uh, we've got fMRI, MEG, and EEG all working together. And as I said, we clinically always recommend that EEG be recorded simultaneously with MEG. Uh, it aids in spike detection and timing studies, which spike comes first, an EEG spike or an MEG spike. As I mentioned, it's highly complementary, but at least in clinical MEG, there's a really strong selection bias to this kind of work uh, because MEG is quite expensive, at least in the in the U.S., and it's typically only ordered by the physicians when the 1020 EEG and other clinical factors are unclear. So they they mutter, "Let's get a meg, see if the meg can figure it out." So we're not taking all comers, we're not looking at all data, we don't get a direct comparison of all cases of MEG versus all cases of EEG, not at least clinically. Uh, but, you know, theoretically, they shouldn't have to be upstairs. I say upstairs because your meg's usually down in the basement somewhere. Uh, they should be running high density EEG. And I think we're going to see uh, some talks on electrical source imaging uh, where we typically have at least 64, if not more electrodes. And everything shows in theory, we've published on this the past two, that high density scalp EEG should yield analogous source models comparable to everything you just saw in MEG. So why isn't it being done uh, in practice? One, and I won't belabor this too much, but you've got to pick a, a, a conductivity level for the EEG model. You can pick the conductivity ratios of inner skull, outer skull, but you also need an overall uh, flat number of conductivity and dipole amplitude is exactly linear with assumed conductivity. So now you have another slider in your model, what do you think the conductivity is? And by moving the conductivity back and forth, you can immediately adjust the dipole amplitude. So there's a bit of a ambiguity of, <clears throat> of dipole amplitude that MEG does not have. We can directly in interpret the dipole amplitude of MEG. EEG has got a bit more of a problem trying to guess what the amplitude means. But the real problem also though is the realistic skull tends to drive the EEG problem uh, more severely. And so this is, we've just completed an, in brainstorm uh, yesterday's discussions uh, on tour spot source toolboxes or, or uh, software toolboxes was at three in the morning, my time. So I was not up for that. So I, I uh, hope you all had a good session on that. Uh, but this is now inside a brainstorm. Uh, we've been working with Karsten Walters on our, our grant and uh, talk for Venus Madani at the USC under Richard Leahy. It's, uh, conquered quite well the implementation of new neuro within the brainstorm environments. We have a nice MATLAB interface to it. And we've been testing it in a number of ways. This is a, a model we put together with a, just five compartments, scalp, skull, CSF, gray matter, white matter. Within each compartment is still isotropic though, being one of the nice things about finite elements, you can put in anisotropy. This we're still just working with isotropic elements, but at least putting in more models and looking at how the lead fields flow throughout this medium if you put on two scalp electrodes. Now these, these lead fields you see flowing through here, so each and every one of these components was calculated up, but these lead fields flowing between these two are, the length has nothing to do with the strength. The strength is trying to be encoded through here. Most of them are extremely minuscule, but the key that for the, what we're talking about, the problem is you see the currents flow beautifully through the scalp because it's highly conductive, and then they almost uh, essentially rectify to get their way up way through this highly resistive skull. And then once they're back into the more conductive medium, they take off running again. It's the skull that's bedeviling our accuracy in trying to understand how these currents move. So we put together a skull phantom about 25 years ago now, a real human skull, 40 layers of conductive latex to give it a very realistic scalp, and then filled it with conductive gelatin and put up into it uh, 32 optically isolated uh, little tiny current dipoles. Here's one st got stuck as we inserted it in behind the eye socket, but most of them landed very nicely in the jello for brains region. But because it was a hot jello perfusion through their conductive gelatin, it also got into all the brain spaces, diploic space, and saturated up the, the uh, our scalp as well. 
and they were able to run it in the Neuromag 122 at the time, and but also then get a, an EEG off of the 64 channels and then get a CT to get our ground truth of where all the electrodes were. And then we started running all of our favorite source localizations, you know, the music algorithm, our spherical models, our boundary element models. Uh, and no matter how we tried, overall, there was a few exceptions. This is the one stuck behind the eye. Uh, the EEG source location was always two times worse than the MEG. MEG was getting about four millimeters. EEG was getting about eight. They say there's some regions where they're a bit closer together. But the, we tried a variety of models and trying to understand that even though the, if you qualitatively looked at the EEG data, it looked to be a higher signal to noise ratio. It looked cleaner. It looked stronger, particularly compared to that time the Neuromag 122 was a bit noisier. But the MEG model is always outperforming the EEG model. And so we set about really studying again what seems to be driving our models wrong, and a supposition is this is what's still wrong today, is we don't get the skull right. You know, even in this model, we ran that we were running an, a homogeneous brain region, but the real skull is very complex, and these are only like a millimeter thick. There's an extremely resistive bony layer called the outer table, and a very extremely resistive, about 100 to 1, 80 to 1, something in that region. Again, it's arguable, but highly resistive inner table, and then you've got the diploic space in between that's quite conductive. So these lead fields are actually taking quite a tortuous path through this uh, skull and not as simple as what we still think the models are. But at millimeter type sizes, we're still not getting this kind of element to put into our modeling. This is a, you know, a CT of a, of a phantom. You can see the wires passing through in jello. We don't do CTs of controls of research subjects, uh, too much ionizing radiation. We do CTs of patients, but they're patients. And a lot of patients by this point in their, uh, uh, in their treatment already have holes in their head or breaks or uh, resections, uh, breaks that even more greatly complicate how we're getting through this highly resistive barrier. Not only do we have the diploic space, but we also have to then track where are all the sutures they're going through. And then we have the thin regions like the temples that don't even have a diploic space. It's just a single table and you get anywhere near the forehead, then you've got the eye socket, which is extremely thin. So it's, at the end of the day, it's a nightmare trying to understand how the extracranial lead fields get from the contacts on the sensor of the scalp through this bony layer and down into the depths of the brain. So there's still a strong head modeling error with EEG. It's definitely worth working, but it's still a problem today. So, uh, as is also known by the, uh, the docs, a lot of the signals that we're looking for down in the depths of the brain are essentially closed models that uh, multipolar patch we looked at. Uh, if you expand it out, you realize there is no dipolar term. There's only quadrupolar and higher terms. It's because these deeper sources have tortured patterns and they're not even showing up at the scalp or in the MEG. And uh, thanks in part for the last 10 years, the explosion of uh, high, highly precise imaging in the surgical suite, we can now drive dozens of these depth electrodes using a stereotactic frame for stereotactically implanted EEG contacts down at all kinds of regions. Uh, and thanks to the robots, particularly now it's easy, it's easy in finger quotes, uh, but relatively straightforward for a site to implant even bilateral implantations as seen here creating hundreds of contacts recording from all throughout the brain, not just on the peel surface, but at all depths. So what do we do with that kind of data? And this is where we've been doing our most recent work on source modeling to uh, one level we do min norms. And I, I preached min norms to uh, the students as kind of a heat map where you're just projecting from each one of these contacts out to the nearby cortex. Well, also, we've just recently been demonstrating that dipole localization is possible with such a varied array. So if we look at what Brainstorm can do, we see, uh, you know, we bring in the MRI, we bring in the electrodes, we bring them in labeled. This is all some new tools relatively recently developed within Brainstorm that lets you do this even with your own CT data. Uh, it's non-trivial to get the registration and labeling and all the data set up. But once you do, then you can create min norms that map the electrode information onto the cortex and lets you see heat. And then in particular, it lets you play 
movies now of, in this case, seizure onset. So this is what is currently being used clinically is to try to look at hundreds of SEG lines arranged in some sort of pattern. Uh, this is both high, low frequency and high frequency. But even with something like a min-norm mapping onto the heat of the area, you can pretty more readily see now that at low frequencies, there are regions that have sort of a low DC shift that are heating up areas of the brain at low frequencies, while at high, you can appreciate there's some sort of oscillation going on here between the has rather than flashing simultaneously, it seems to be oscillating. Probably would be one conjecture because of a thalamocortical afferent going up in either area, but that's another discussion. But it also lets you, this is a seizure onset in real time. We can look at this array in six different ways, both uh, outside looking in, inside looking out, uh, from below, from above, and have a better interpretation of all of this complex activity on a, on a realistic surface. And then uh, we also do, as I mentioned, do stimulation. This is on not a cortical grid, but a volume grid doing, again, a min norm, stimulating a pair of electrodes here, and then looking at how the rest of the electrode array responded to this stimulation. This is over about 30 averages and played back in one tenth real time. But more recently, we were able to do, we put this in as part of a proposal to NIH that was just successfully scored for another four years of brainstorm. Uh, we ran a patient in the MEG array with an SEG electrode array, and we had IRB permission to stimulate while they're in the MEG a pair of electrodes and recorded simultaneously the MEG and the SEG, uh, the SEG and MEG data. The SEG array make out here in black through these regions was uh, spread throughout there. And then this is the pattern that was seen down in the brain uh, using just the MEG data, so no SEG information, we located the green dipole here using a finite element method. It was about the same for the boundary element and even the overlapping sphere. So the MEG was saying the dipole is about right here in the middle. This is 13 milliseconds into the stimulation. And then we ran finite element boundary element methods using an isotropic assumption and found that the SEG only array also agreed quite well, same orientation, nearly the same location, just a few millimeters apart and not on the SEG array. This was definitely several millimeters away from any nearby one. So it's our first evidence that even with this kind of more arbitrarily patterned array, we can use the same statistics and the same modeling and locate current dipoles in the invasive array. So wrapping it all up, uh, summarizing the last chart, single dipole modeling uh, is particularly useful in clinical use because it can be made rigorous and significant. We can reject bad models for bad chi-square. We can reject bad models for poor confidence intervals, poor volumes of error, uh, and yield out, though, after pass through those, uh, those gateways, a very interpretable current dipole that can be uh, uh, interpreted as a patch of activity and that this so-called primitive equivalent current dipole is actually a sophisticated model of focal neural activity but it's still only a, a rough guess using this concept of the Okada constant. Uh, but we have taken large arrays of data, mapped them onto surface patterns, run them through inversion techniques that allow us to make these interpretations. Uh, we're testing still a variety of head models uh, that most recently the finite elements that'll let us be uh, work particularly with anisotropy and use some of the DTI work coming through to come up with better lead fields of the interior regions. But at this point, we're still finding even that the min-norm heat maps uh, within the invasive area are still particularly useful, and that we're evolving now into dipole models of SEG as well. And with that, I thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, John, for this really nice talk. Uh, we now have time for a few questions. Are there questions in the audience? I, yeah. <laughs> There's a question from Christian above, please. Hello, John. It's very nice uh, seeing you again. 
Um, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, you discussed the difference between the multiple model and the dipole model in, in context of the surface signals. Now, when you are in, in, in the depth, so you're showing it's going pretty well, but don't you expect that you have higher errors uh, coming from not taking into account the multipolar? Because when you're close, sources are less uh, dipolar than when you're far. Right. Well, so yeah, that makes it particularly in the depths. If the dipolar term is dropping off, it does leave behind the quadrupolar term, but the quadrupolar term is falling off another uh, factor of R greater. So it's even weaker, that component and the statistical significance of those parameters is difficult to find. So yeah, that would be definitely as we want to do the invasive modeling. I'm more worried about that, that when now I've got invasive electrodes, I am in the vicinity of these, I can see the quadrupolar components. So I haven't really pursued in recent years looking at quadrupolar components of uh, surface data, but definitely need to open it back up for the invasive data. These SEG electrodes are in the vicinity of the sources and should see these higher order moments, even for what are relatively closed sources. But the quadrupolar components, the next term in the multipolar series, is falling off rather than R squared, falling off as R cubed. So they actually are dramatically weaker already anyway. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, if not, then I, I'd like to ask a question, please. Um, so you, you mentioned that um, when you look at uh, epileptic activity, um, it's about 10 times uh, larger than sort of regular activity. And somewhere else in your talk, you mentioned that this, uh, the amplitude uh, we measure uh, somewhat scale to the actual spatial extent uh, of the source. And my question is, is that really the only answer or does those numbers also tell us something about the, how, how functional the cortical tissue is. I mean, is this, or another way to put it, are those large numbers in epilepsy really the reflection of large sources, or does it also tell us about um, the underlying, um, there's something about the underlying disease? That's a very fair question. So even when Okada was measuring his SEG patients, I uh, need to go back and look, was he measuring just normal activity between seizures or the actual epileptic activity? You've got kind of both aspects. I mean, if all the cells were columnar and uh, firing at a greater concentration within the cortical column, then you could get a greater signal strength out for the same surface area. But abnormal regions tend to also be dysplastic, so they're not columnar organized. So you have an ambiguity here of uh, just uh, how are these pyramidal cells, how is the EPSB or, or a spike summing together in what is not only folded cortex but dysplastic cortex so we don't really have a strong answer for uh, exactly how big should that be it's a guess to say we can use the okada constant and say that 200 nanoamp meters is a minimum of 200 square millimeters the support i have for that is that that's what has been reported by others when they're trying to guess how much cortex was involved for nendorectal spike they're reporting out two, three, four, 500 square millimeters of cortex involved in generating a spike. But your point's well taken. We can't just assume a columnar organization and a summation that gave us that that, that spike, but we, we really don't know. There's a massive ambiguity there. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's no further question, well, we'd like to thank uh, John once more and move up to the next speaker.